Trigger Warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. Happy Friday. And I know what you're wondering. Why is there an episode of the Preacher Boys podcast dropping on a Friday instead of a Sunday? And that's a good question. And I'll get to that question, but please be patient. Uh, This week has been absolutely uh, surreal, for lack of a better word. Uh, I have felt every possible emotion you can feel uh, since the premiere of Let Us Pray. Uh, officially seven days ago was the premiere of part one of the docuseries that is exposing abuse within independent fundamental Baptist churches. If you haven't watched it yet, you're going to see yours truly in the series. But more importantly, you're going to hear from some incredible survivors, some who have been on this show in the past you may have heard from before, uh, and some you may have never heard of and whose stories need to be heard. And I am telling you, as somebody who was involved, and I'm probably biased, uh, I think this is an absolutely incredible, incredible series. And from what I'm hearing from people online, it seems to be a sentiment that is shared by a lot of people. Um, I'm very thrilled with how this series came out. I think the director, producer, the entire team behind it did an amazing job. I'm incredibly honored to be a part of it. And I'm thankful that I got to hang out with some uh, incredible survivors who become close friends uh, in person as we shot this series. And uh, just if you haven't watched Let Us Pray, I mean, turn off my podcast right now and go to get a trial of Max, or if you already have Max because you're amazing, uh, go tune in and watch the series. It is well worth your time. And uh, yeah, I have to tell you, uh, coming out of the series, I mean, part one, there's this excitement, right? We've been waiting for three years for this to come out. You know, you get into part one and, you know, my thought process was, oh my God, we're on TV, you know, like there's that element of it because it's a really bizarre thing to be seeing. You know, we went out to this wing restaurant uh, in South Carolina. It was a terrible uh, restaurant, by the way. But as a plus, they did have investigation discovery on the TV and I actually saw an ad for the show the night of the premiere while sitting in this wing restaurant. It was very surreal and very weird. So that, that part's there. But almost immediately when you start watching the documentary series, you know, almost everybody in it, I have personally met and talked to uh, a handful of those have become extremely close friends over the last year, um, two years, three years since starting the show. And almost immediately when the excitement wears off of, oh, this is so cool. This is so surreal. This is incredible. There is that feeling of sadness um, because you know deeply, deeper than the series could ever cover some of the pains that some of these survivors have been through, all of these survivors have been through. Uh, At the same time, you feel an immense amount of pride in them for speaking up. Uh, You feel admiration when you see the bravery. Uh, I mean, Ruthie's, my goodness, I don't want to spoil anything, but just some of the things Ruthie says in that final episode are just incredible. Um, And I spent the, almost the entire, the entirety, I can't even talk, almost the entirety of part two just crying Um, because I know these people, I know their stories and seeing them captured in such a thoughtful, beautiful and caring, compassionate way by the filmmakers was absolutely amazing. And I am just, it is an incredible honor to be anywhere near this uh, documentary series. And uh, I'm just feeling right now, you know, the way I hope most people felt when they watched it, which is there's a lot more work to do and there's a lot more survivors that need to be heard. And I hope, and and from what I see so far, this series is starting a lot of conversations that have been waiting for a reason to happen. And there's some really good things coming out of this. And it's been just amazing seeing dialogue from people within the IFB, from people who've left the IFB, from recovering fundamentalist crowd to the people who 
aren't even religious anymore. There has just been an amazing amount of great feedback and a deluge of messages. Of course, there's detractors. Of course, there's people who will, you know, stay by the brand till the end. And you know what? Um, I'm happy to ignore those voices. Um, But anyway, I wanted to do this episode. It's a completely bonus episode. And it's actually not an episode of the Preacher Boys podcast, per se. This is from my interview with Rachel Bernstein on the Indoctrination podcast. Now, if you've never listened to the Indoctrination podcast, very different tone than this show. Uh, But it is with Rachel Bernstein, who is a licensed uh, therapist, and she works a lot with people who have experienced high control groups or cultish environments. And she interviewed me on her podcast, Indoctrination, about my story. I don't spend a lot of time on my personal story on the Preacher Boys podcast, but in the wake of the documentary, a lot of messages that I got included something along the lines of, Where's more of your story? Um, Where can I find on the podcast? Like what episode you go into detail? And there's not really many I've gone into great detail, uh, but Rachel was kind enough and her team was kind enough to send me a copy of our interview and allow me to upload it to my feed. Uh, So you're about to listen to my story with Rachel and you can tell she's a therapist because she gets some questions out or some answers out of me that I was surprised she got out of me. And she made me think about things in ways I'd never thought about them before. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I've been a guest on a lot of podcasts at this point. Far and away, the best podcast appearance experience I've ever had uh, was with Rachel and her team and doing this episode. It felt in many ways like a therapy session. Uh, It was, uh, it got my brain thinking about things. It was extremely touching. Some of the places the conversation went. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful dialogue with a amazing person who uh, look forward to having on the show uh, here very soon to talk to her and get to put her in the hot seat. But uh, enjoy this conversation on the Indoctrination podcast in today's bonus episode and uh, get a glimpse at my turbulent journey through the independent fundamental Baptist movement and beyond, as they say. So here's the episode again. Happy Friday. Uh, go watch Let Us Pray if you haven't already and uh, buckle up because we're about to get started right now. It is so nice to have Eric Skorzynski with me today. It is so great to be able to talk to you. Do you mind just taking a moment and introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Eric Skorzynski. I'm the host of the Preacher Boys podcast where I talk about abuse within independent fundamental Baptist churches. But beyond doing that, it's drawn an audience of people from all kinds of backgrounds that are somewhat similar, because at the end of the day, a lot of the structures look the same. Um, But I've been doing that for about three years, and uh, that's been kind of the way we've been connected. So look forward to talking. Yeah, I know. It's really nice. It's really nice to talk to someone who's been out there getting the word out and trying to do a lot of education, prevention, telling people stories, helping other people and facilitating other people being able to tell their stories, which is very powerful. Sort of the reason that I started this podcast So I would love to know about your history, and I'd love to know about Preacher Boys, and also with this being part of the Baptist Church, which is interesting. People have asked me about that. What is the link and what is the tie-in with other Baptist churches, if any? Usually with these independent groups, they really are their own thing. They really have their own way of operating, their own philosophy, their own theology, and uh, become kind of an island unto themselves. So tell us a little bit about you from your early days. So let us get to know you as a, as a youngin. I mean, I was born into the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And from here on out, I'll say IFB for the most part. So independent fundamental Baptist movement, uh, IFB is a lot shorter. So I grew up within it. Uh, my parents were on staff at the Christian school and the church that was associated with it. And so I really grew up on the same campus from the time I was born to the time I graduated high school. Um, I went to kindergarten through 12th grade in the same building. Monday through Friday was in school. Saturday was out inviting people to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night was attending church services. So it literally was a matter of spending more time connected to the church than at my own home. And, um, you know, I look back at that now and go, that's probably not healthy. Uh, But at the time, for the majority of my early life, I loved it. I had friends in the church. I, you know, my best friends and I learned how to ride bikes around the church property. Like it was a very positive environment. And uh, I really believed that 
we had the truth. We were this like righteous church set on a hill and everyone else in the community was misguided or just straight up wrong. And so the best way I can explain the belief system is if someone's familiar with basic Baptist theology, um, which would be very similar to evangelicalism in a lot of ways, I would just say ratchet that up to 11. And that was our version of it. So instead of just being, you believe in Jesus Christ and you get baptized and that's your religious belief, you go to church every Sunday, it was uh, you read the King James Bible only, you don't dance, you don't go to movies, you don't listen to music that has a beat in it, you don't spend time hanging out with people who are not of the same religion as you, um, you wear suits to church, you don't wear t-shirts and jeans. Like It was just a very extreme movement, and the goalposts are constantly moving. So you would accept Jesus as your Savior. Great. Now you need to start doing this. Now you need to start doing this ministry. Now you need to get involved in this way. And it was constantly, you aren't good enough. We're going to keep raising the stakes on you. And um, like I said, I thrived in that environment for a long time, but it wasn't until I started realizing that there were some severe issues that that all started falling apart and that bubble burst in a big way, going from we're perfect to, oh no, are we wrong <laughs> completely? Wow. Okay. So, you know, you just highlighted something that I have seen for my last 32 years in this business, which is so often that there is this air of superiority, right? We have it. We have the answer. We're protected. We're following what God wants. And everyone else, as you said, is misguided and wrong. But yet, within the organization itself, you still can't quite get it right. So you're better than the others, but you're still not quite okay in your group. And so when I work with people who have left, they will often tell me that they have a hard time just feeling like other people and being able to see eye to eye that they don't have to be better than, they don't have to feel less than, they don't have to prove themselves in some way, they can just be. And they also can be part of the world which is sometimes hard because it's a world that you had been taught to look down on. There's so much sort of jockeying for if we're better or less than looking outward and looking inward. And I bet it's just hard to relax and feel like you're okay. Yeah. Well, you're you're raised with this arrogant attitude where you're measuring everyone against you. And then everyone in leadership that you care about is measuring you against them and this other higher standard. And so it's constantly this feeling, like you said, of superiority over, I'm not like them, you know, we're better than them. But on the flip side, it's this constant desire for approval from leadership that you're ultimately never really going to get. And I was on that treadmill for a really long time. And it's something to this day, now that I've been out of it for a long time now, it's something still where in business relationships, in client relationships, I will find myself in a position going, do they actually like me? Do they actually appreciate me? Are they only using me for this skill that benefits them? You know, And then on the other side, it's something where humility is something you have to learn and teach yourself. Because even though you're taught, hey, you're a sinner, you're wretched, you're this, you're also taught, you know, you are in many ways better than the Catholic down the street or the Mormon down the street or the atheist, especially the atheist down the street, because they're so far gone, you know, in your eyes. So it's a very difficult mental situation to involve yourself in. Very difficult. And right. So if you have this air of superiority or even kind of entitlement to a certain degree to believe certain things about people, uh, to feel about the world the way you do, and you're you're needing to infuse that humility, it is very hard to then suddenly feel like you are an insecure, mm, superior thinking person. Like, how are you supposed to think about yourself? And then, yes, exactly, as you said, you're going to assume that other people are seeing you through a similar lens, being really critical, or that you're just useful to them in some way, but they don't really value you. That is very, very hard. I was wondering also when you said that your parents were on staff, what did that mean? How many hours of devotion were they paid? What did they do? I'm curious about all that. Yeah. So as far as my parents, my my dad was raised Catholic, but very nominal Catholic. 
like my mom makes fun of him now because we'll ask him a question about something in Catholicism and he'll go, I don't know. And we're like, weren't you a Catholic like for a long time? And so he was a Catholic. He got quote unquote saved into the Baptist faith midway through childhood. Um, his parents or his mom remained Catholic. Uh, my mom grew up in a Baptist sect that was very similar to the IFB, um, and her parents were missionaries. So she was very familiar with that world. And, you know, when I was growing up, my dad was a postal worker for a long time. And then around the time I hit, uh, I think, second or third grade, my, my dad quit his job, his government job and started working for the church. You know, going from a secure government job to ministry was an apparent <laughs> thing. Um, you know, the finances were tight. You know, I won't get into specifics or estimates of what they were making, but I know it was a very small amount. We grew up extremely poor. Um, you know, my mom made, I know, less than half of what my dad was making just because she was a female in that environment. So typically in IFB churches, you have the man who's hired, and then they get their wife at a discounted half rate to do the same amount of work in a different area and with less authority because, again, they're a female in the church. And so, you know, growing up, like, I just know financially we struggled a lot. Again, I realize more now how much we financially struggled. As a kid, you know what you know. But yeah, ministry lifestyle was you are poor, God is going to provide, which means the church isn't going to. And, um, you know, I have a lot of memories of bills not being able to be paid, power being shut off, struggling to make it by, all while your parents, like my dad would work some days from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. just on the campus, and you're going, well, I'm not seeing my dad, but I know this is for something that's, you know, a greater good. I say all that to say, too, my parents in a lot of ways were manipulated in things, too. So I don't hold, while I hold them responsible for some things, there's also some areas in which I think they were victims of a system that was chewing them up and spitting them out as well. And I think they see that now in a lot of ways that maybe they didn't before. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask about where they are on this now. So we'll get to that next. I think, you know, from the people I work with, they will talk about having a job for their church. And then there were so many extras. And if there were holidays, they needed to work extra. They were expected also to do free labor a lot of the time or even watch other people's kids. And that the children within the family often felt like they really didn't have as much access to their parents as the church did or as even other kids did, especially if their parents were teachers in the school and they got to be with other people's children. Uh, but yeah, you hear about people being used for construction, for being for cooking in the kitchen for everyone without any kind of pay, um, but just the expectation of working very, very hard. And usually the people there are working much harder than the leaders who write. I mean, the the leaders are kind of living off, not kind of, but absolutely living off the the sweat and the work and the devotion of the people there. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's something where... You know, it was a little different for me in the sense of they worked at the school in the church where I was at, which, so I saw them, but it was always in the terms of ministry, you know, like, and, and my parents were great. Like, I think for given the environment that we were in, they did a good job of giving the attention in ways they could, like they would stop by and say hi in the classroom. But it's also like, again, it's like, it was the healthiest version of an unhealthy situation. So it's like a weird thing to measure. And, you know, I think some people listen to go, it doesn't sound good at all, you know, but it's, again, from my experience, there were things that were, when you're in a cultish bubble, it's like your whole, all your good and bad memories are in one jumbled mess. And so I think you have to, for your own sanity, in some ways, you have to look at what was good and what do I look back with fondness, even though, yeah, in retrospect, we aren't even at that church. You know, like there's a whole different conversation happening. But as far as labor, I mean, that's something I think about now. Like I was, I mean, by the time I was 11, 12, you know, 13, like I was moving everyone that, you know, moved to the area and was joining the staff kind of church. I would move them into their house. I was unloading trucks, you know, the, the foundation for where they want to build a new building that I don't think is ever going to get built. You know, I was laying dirt and shoveling holes and laying brick walls. Like it was constantly tasks and chores associated with the church. And now I realize like some of that stuff's not even really a legal thing, <laughs> you know, some of the things that we were doing. Um, but it was just a way of life. It's like, what is the mission of the church? And everybody's on duty to do that. Like we're a team, we're gonna, we're gonna carry this stuff out. Right. 
Yeah. When I talk to people and they remember the work that they did <laughs> uh, without hard hats, <laughs> without any kind of safety, anything, um, safety goggles, safety, anything. Yeah, it really was beyond what kids are usually allowed to do and should safely be expected to do. Uh, I wonder if there was just the sense that you were protected because you were, you know, believing the right way. Like, I wonder if that really caused people to just feel like people could take risks. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think it's that. I think it's just, and it's one of the things that's hardest about leaving a fundamentalist group is that in a fundamentalist group, you have a strong sense of purpose. And I think that's something you see happen when people leave these kind of groups is they go, what do I do? Who am I? Where am I supposed to go? Who am I supposed to follow now? Like, what am I supposed to, to work on? What do I like? And I think growing up in fundamentalism, you don't question doing anything because the purpose is so big. Like we are working on something of eternal value. So if someone says, hey, do you want to come up, you know, 7 a.m. and build a brick wall? Yeah, that sounds awesome. Cause like we're helping build up the church, you know, and I get to hang out with my youth pastor who's awesome. And I get to hang out with my friends who are also going to be building this brick wall. So it was never something where I was going, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Like I was a questioner. I asked questions, but the response was always rooted in this higher purpose. So when that's your answer, when it's like God said, or this is God's will, it's like, okay, great. Let me grab a shovel. I'll be there. You know, hopefully there's donuts, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully there's donuts. <laughs> right. That makes everything better. But I, yeah, I think when, when people ask me how my work is sometimes different from a different kind of therapy work or general therapist, um, I often say that I get asked a question that other therapists don't often get asked where a client will say to me, who am I and why am I here? And going right to the existential, what is my identity and what is my meaning? And then also, what do I like and what do I feel and what is okay? Because that's a whole other issue of things that were made okay that are not okay. And a whole sort of ethical core that needs to be shifted to translate into the real world and sometimes needs to be changed a bit. But I think it, it is hard to, to think about identity. And But when you're young, yeah, you're going to be noticing what you really like, which is hanging out with friends and doing something that feels exciting and meaningful. And I'm glad you have good memories. I would hope that you would. Um, so it wasn't all a wash because that would be sad. Yeah. No, it, it, like I said, you have to take the good and the bad and you have to dissect what those were and what lessons were good and what what wasn't. And that's a difficult thing to do. Some people don't want to do that work. And I, I see them really having a hard time. And I think, I just think it's important. I don't think that means you forgive all of the bad things. I think it just means that you accept that life comes in good and bad. And, you know, you, there's experience of true camaraderie and there's moments of true work ethic that you learn. There's moments of true, like there are lessons that I took away that have helped me. There are also things that have scarred me in ways that will always affect me in some way. And um, I think wholeness is embracing both of those things and saying, this is me, like, and now I get to do the work, the fun work, the fulfilling work of going, what do I like? Who do I like? What type of people do I want to be around? Like that kind of stuff is really amazing, but it's just so difficult initially when you're not taught how to think. You're not taught how to think, right. And I also think that's a failing within general society. I think that part of what kids should be learning like at elementary school level is how to question and how to think, how to decipher, how to discern, how to collect data and figure out what is real. Because I think that's something that's going to keep people in good stead and a lot safer. But I do think that if the cult leader, if you're involved in a cultic group, if the cult leader could actually leave, then you'd be left with nicer people um, who were probably healthier, who were well-meaning, by and large, not all, but who had the sense that they were there and, and really were there kind of for the right reasons. And then it would be a much healthier organization all around. It's just when the, the leadership 
is not okay in the way they run it and the way they feel and what they make okay, that again is not okay. That's where the problems I think come in. So it makes sense that you're going to have some good memories because you were surrounded probably by good people to a great degree. I'm wondering though, when you're saying there's some things that left you feeling scarred, can we talk about some of those things? Yeah. I mean, and again, I think that's been a process because there's things that didn't affect me initially that now retroactively I go, you know, I, I'm a parent now myself. I am, you know, the age of the people that were my youth pastors. And so now I'm viewing things going, how did they think that was okay? Because I'm that age now and I've matured to a point I realize that's not okay. And so, you know, there's things that happen definitely then. And then there's things that I've retroactively seen. The moment the bubble bursts, I think, is the biggest scar. So I went from believing wholeheartedly the message. like, And I like to say this over and over again because people tend to go, oh, you're probably a rebellious kid and you just found lots of things to rebel about and you hated the church, you want to tear it apart. I love the church. And I found most people who are the most outspoken advocates love the church and that's why the bad things hurt so much. And so... The moment my bubble burst was in 2011. Uh, we had a, so I was in 10th ish grade, somewhere in there. Um, and I was, uh, I found out that a basketball coach and youth pastor that was at a church in Northern California was going to be coming to our church in Southern California and joining our church. And I was very familiar with this person. I knew kids on his team because we had gone to basketball camps and basketball tournaments up in Northern California with them. And when I found out the news, I texted the kid on his team that I knew and said, hey, are you sad that your coach is leaving and your youth pastor at the time? And he said, not really. I'm kind of angry because he just left out of nowhere. And I was like, that's weird. So I Googled to see if the church had put out like a, you know, totally innocently going, did they put out a farewell announcement or, hey, here's what he's going to be working on now. And like, why is he coming to our church? What's he going to be doing? And the first thing that popped up in Google was warrant issued for Chico youth pastor arrest, molestation of teenage girl. And I read that piece of information and went, what? Like, this is something I've heard about the Catholics doing, but like, this doesn't happen in the Baptist church. Like, molestation and this, there's a warrant, now he's coming here. And he came to our church and instantly got involved teaching a sixth grade Sunday school class, was singing specials in the church was heavily involved. And I'm seeing there's someone where I have this information now. I don't know what to do with it. My highest authority is the pastor. Um, this guy's higher on the, you know, higher in the rank than me because he was a leader. So it's like, what do I do? Who do I tell? Where do I go with this? And so for a couple of days, I'm going, I don't know what to do. And then I started going to leadership. I went to my parents, went to youth pastor, went to eventually the senior pastor. And all I was met with was either, okay, like, what do you want us to do about it? Or the more common was, you're bitter, you need to forgive, you're angry about nothing. You know, I had conversations with people because you have to understand, like, I'm a teenage kid and my bubble's been burst. My safe space is violated. And now I'm sitting there going, oh, my youth pastor doesn't care about this. He's not worried about it. And we have teenagers and my friends are the age of the girl that this youth pastor prayed on. Like all of these things are happening. And I'm my bubble of like, or my circle of people I trust is just shrinking. And so I get to a point by the middle of that year, I'm just going, I can't sleep. I feel depressed. I'm stressed out. I'm anxious. You know, like literally the biggest thing was like, I could not sleep. Like all I would think about all day was this situation. And the fact that Sunday morning, I'm sitting in a pew and this guy's on the platform. And my friends are the age of the girl that he's victimized. And I would be told, it's stupid that you're losing sleep. Focus on yourself. And just you're bitter, you're bitter, you're bitter. You need to forgive. And long story short, I mean, I went through the last two years pushing back on that and having outbursts about that and fighting about that. And up until about two years ago, they were still at the church. He was still leading music. His wife ended up becoming the principal of the school that I grew up in. So for over a decade, basically he won. And I got to a point where everyone at the church slowly started, especially in the staff level, started going, Eric's just a bitter kid. He hates the church. This narrative got painted. 
And it's like, no, no, like it wouldn't have sat with me the way it did if I didn't care about this situation. And so um, that was the big bubble burst moment. I've had a couple more that happened post high school, but that was like the big one where I went from, oh, we're perfect to, oh, we're really not. And it's actually really scary. And this feels like all of the things I was warned about happening outside the church. Oh, that's very interesting. Right. That outside the church, there are going to be no safeguards and people can yeah. be bad people and get away with it. Well, they would preach about the Catholic church. They would say, you know, the pedophile priests and this and the jokes about like that, because that stuff was all very top of mind. And it's like, then I'm sitting there going, my dad was raised Catholic. He knows how bad the Catholics are, but my dad's still on staff at a church where they allow a predator on the platform. Like, it was so weird. Like, it was just such a, it's still weird. And it's one of those things, like, it's never going to make sense because it doesn't. But I remember sitting, crying outside of my house with my youth pastor in the car after we had dropped kids off for the bus ministry, you know? And I remember sitting there crying, saying, you're supposed to protect us. And it seems like this is such a clear, like, protect us moment, and you don't care. And I got out of the van and shut the door, walked in my house. By the minute I walked in the house, he had texted my dad saying I was rebellious, that I was, you know, and that led to an altercation with my dad, you know? So it was like, everything just felt like, okay, why is no one getting this? <laughs> like, and I still feel that way, you know, now at 28 years old. But at the time it was, you don't have anywhere else to go. Like, you got to live with your parents. You got to go to school where you go to school. You got to go to church where you go to church. It's a, it's literally just a, the bubble kind of becomes a cage at that point. To know that you were really grappling with your conscience on this, that something was really wrong about it for you. It is tremendously lonely when it seems like it's only affecting you and it's only bothering you. And that the people around you, especially the adults, don't care. And there are no safeguards within the the church, which you're not even going to be thinking about if you don't know that things could be happening that are wrong. The idea also that someone could be accused of something and then be invited, <laughs> same person, be invited to work with kids, teens at your church. You're going to really wonder if you're safe anymore and if your friends are safe anymore. And you're also going to wonder why no one cares. It's very hard when you can't get people to care, especially when you've been raised with this, I think, very moralistic kind of attitude and teachings. And how come it's all breaking down here? It's going to be feel like kind of the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, like none of this is making sense. Yeah, exactly. The people that imbued that moral compass on me, the people that raised me, that taught me Sunday school, are now the people where I'm like having to take a moral stance. <laughs> and so it's a very weird position to be in where you're going, hey, spiritual moral leader, you're being spiritually morally wrong. Like, that feels so fish out of water, like to be sitting there crying, going, hey, you're supposed to be doing this and you're not doing this, but also feeling like, well, I can't go to any other authority beyond the pastor. Like the buck stops there, like calling the police and saying, hey, this guy who has a warrant, is that our church? That never comes to mind. Or that, or this, hey, I don't know if you should be around kids. Like there's just nothing else to do, nowhere else to turn. Right. And, you know, sometimes people will ask me how I define a cult or just an unhealthy organization of any kind. And one of the things that I talk about is that the truth tellers are vilified, that the the people who are trying to hold a mirror up to what's happening are seen as the problem. And the ones who are the whistleblowers are seen as being problematic, as being whatever, all the things that you were called. But within a, a structure that's healthy, they're going to invite people to tell them what is happening that could be wrong and what's on their mind and they can discuss it. And But if they have really no, if they have no system in place and really kind of no interest in place, to do anything differently, then they're just going to want everyone to go along with the way it is. Um, so 
I know that, you know, there, there have been books written about this. And I think I always think of the book 1984 because the, the, you know, the people who were sort of noticing what was going wrong were the ones who were the most vilified and, and pathologized. And so same thing happened with you that by the time you got into your house already, you were diagnosed <laughs> as having a problem and all you were doing was pointing out a problem. That's very hard, very hard. I'm sorry that you went through that. So incredible. Now, did you have other friends that you could talk to about this while you were there? Yeah, so I had some friends that I definitely talked to. I think, again, there was a mix of like how much I shared. I One of my best friends at the time, who I'm still close to, even though we're, we live very far apart now, like, you know, I would talk to him about it. And, but again, it's like, we're all kind of blindly in the blind. Like, what do you say? You know? And then my wife now at the time who I met in high school, like I talked to her about it a lot, but I think it was just this moment of like, I don't know what to tell you because we're all in the same boat, right? It's like, it's like a bunch of prisoners saying this prison guard's really mean. It's like, it doesn't matter how many prisoners agree, like nothing's really going to happen to the prison guard, you know, because you're just not in the hierarchy. And then when you try to tell other prison guards, like they're all in his boys club. So it's just not going to matter. And so it was really just, it was the equivalent of banging your head against the wall and, you know, for, for two years. And I just got to a point where it was like, I'm going to graduate. I'm not coming back to this. Like, I'm going to go do what I'm going to do and figure out from there. Um, you know, do my one year Bible college, then go move somewhere where no one's going to ask me, Hey, how often are you going to church? You know, that sort of conversation. So, right. So I do want to talk about that, about when you left and, and if that was really the catalyst or that was sort of the beginning of the crack, right. And, and what happened that, mm, that really propelled you out of the church? Yeah, I don't know if it's propelled. It was kind of like <laughs> slowly figuring it out. I mean, it was like it was kind of like just a massive wake up call when that happened. And then it was like little massive wake up calls, like almost like aftershocks to the initial earthquake that just kind of gets you all the way out. When I graduated, I had registered for one year of Bible college because they, you know, and that was, you know. I did not want to do that because I didn't want to end up being a pastor. I knew I wanted to do videography. I wanted to do media. I wanted to do all the things I'm doing now, ironically. But I I knew if I went, they were going to try to get me into their funnel to become a pastor. And I didn't want to do that. And I knew that even when I was devoted, I was like, I wanted to be the best Christian filmmaker ever. But it was like, I don't want to be a pastor. That's not what I want to do. So I was registered for college. I was begrudgingly doing that. I picked one that was close to home so I could be near my girlfriend, who's my wife at the time. Um, and I got a call about two months before I was supposed to start college. So I was wrapping up school. I think it was May or April, and I was graduating in June. And it was from a leader from a Christian camp that I had met who did design and media. And he had a Christian media company. And he called me and said, do you want to go help shoot a documentary in India for three weeks and then intern with me for a year? Or do you want to go to Bible college? And I said, I just canceled my application to Bible college. I'm going to come shoot a documentary. So I went and moved to Fresno, California, went and shot a documentary in India, worked interning for a year, actually for two years, going and shooting media and commercials for IFB churches all over the country. You know, I went to three different countries and I think 18 different states over the course of two years. So again, when people say you had a bad experience in one church, it's like, I got to see a lot of different flavors and branches and deal with a lot of different personalities over that time. But I did that. And one of the one of the groups that I encountered and shot for in the second year was a missions organization. And I went out of the country. I filmed in India. I filmed in the Dominican and I filmed in Cuba. And I saw the work they were doing. I saw the orphanage they had. I saw the trainings they were doing. And I was so bought in. I was like, this is beautiful. You're changing lives, which in a lot of ways they were. They were feeding kids that weren't getting fed. They were putting shelter for kids that didn't have shelter. I was like, I need to do this. And over that two-year period, I'm trying to give you this long story in a short version, but over that two-year period, I had really rekindled what I would say was like my faith. Like I was like, what we had been taught was wrong. 
but now I truly understand the gospel. And I was following some big leaders that had said big words I'd never heard before. I was really researching and was on fire for what I believed to be God at the time. And so I was like, this is great. I can do ministry. I can use my gifts that I've had my whole life in a way that's going to actually create change and save orphans and help widows and really be true religion, undefiled. Like, that's going to be this. And I worked with them for about a year remotely. I was proposed to my now wife. You know, we got married. The time we got married, I was making $500 a month from this organization. And as I got close to my wedding, I started reaching out to the leader of the organization and I knew we were getting more donations. I know that my work was helping because that was my job was bringing in support. And I said, hey, I'm getting ready to get married. I'm making $500 a month. That was fine when I was a single guy, but I need to start making enough to support a family. I've been here for a year. Let's move out of the intern stage and into like, which I already was full-time staff. And he wrote me in a message and said, I could remove this issue from you but I would be robbing you of you seeing God work a miracle. And at the time, I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, at the time, I was like, that's really profound. You know, it's like, I could I could get a raise or God could really provide. And it's like, God couldn't provide through my employer who I was working for. And so I got married making $500 a month. Uh, we moved to India. We lived there for two months. I was taking pictures, video, all that sort of stuff at the orphanage. Uh, we got pregnant. My wife miscarried while we were on the field, and we ended up having to cut a one-year trip short to two months. We came back, and there was a lot of just, why are things happening constantly so bad when I'm doing everything right? And it really made me grapple with just everything. It was like, why am I getting paid so little when I'm giving so much? And why am I you know, why did this happen to us when we're giving God our lives? Like, why would he take our child? And there was things where, you know, I, I mean, the director of the missions organization, I called him the day that that happened. And the first question he asked was, well, your wife's not upset at God, right? Like she still wants to do missions. It was such a cold, like every interaction was increasingly cold and calculated to, well, you're still going to be in your role, right? And it just kept going like that. And I could go on of all these little things that happened and all the mental things that happened and all the spiritual things inside that I was thinking. But ultimately, it was just little things like that just really ate away at me. And once we came back to the US, we moved to where the home church was in Virginia. We attended there. It was during the election cycle. And I was still bought into Christianity, but I had seen too much outside of American Christianity. and. During that election cycle, when I started seeing people in that home church circling the flag to pray for Donald Trump to be elected, it was like, look, I'm out, you know? And I kept my faith, I was out. And then over the next several years, it was just a matter of like, the simplest way I can say it is, it wasn't a matter of me seeing the bad and then just being disillusioned. It was, I was in a pursuit of looking for some kind of unexplainable supernatural goodness inherent to Christianity. And I didn't see anything about Christianity or fundamentalist Christianity specifically that couldn't happen in any other setting. It was like, instead, we're just as bad, if not worse, than the Harvey Weinsteins in Hollywood. We're just as bad as the Catholic Church that was so vilified. We were just as bad as all the other groups we were talking about. And it just became a, rather than a snap decision, it was like a slow death of first fundamentalism and then ultimately, you know, my faith. And that's the short version. <laughs> if you had three hours, you get a little <laughs> bit into like the slightly longer version. Okay. Well, hopefully at some point we'll be able to go over the longer version, but that is a very powerful story. I I think about all of the language that was used to justify not mm, treating you the way you deserve to be treated, not mm, giving you what you deserved with all of your hard work. And I'm sure, you know, living in places that were not easy, seeing things that were not easy. I mean, it's, it can be a traumatizing time. And so there should be some pay for that, hazard pay, emotional hazard pay. But the comment also about losing the child and the, yeah, the callousness, the, okay, but um, what about us? 
it, it's such a stark contrast to that sort of warm community family feeling that they're supposed to be coming across like um, and that you may have remembered in that way. But here were the cold, hard facts. And similar to where we started this conversation, just wondering about when you're working, if people are just using you for, you know, whatever it is that they can extract from you. No wonder you have that worry and that feeling because that really was happening. And you find out in those moments that is really harsh. I mean, I'm a videographer, photographer, like so I have a camera, everyone knows it. And it is something I joke with people when they ask, but it's something that is like a deep cut when I get invited somewhere and someone says, hey, are you bringing your camera? And I know it's not a thing of like, they want to use me. Like I know, especially with my circle now that I've very carefully curated at this point, I know that's not the conversation, but it's still something where I instantly go, oh, that's why I'm invited, you know? And even though I have to tell myself, hey, that's your instinct, but that's not necessarily right. Like look at who they are, look at what you know to be true about this situation. That's still my instinct to where now when I go to events, I don't take anything like that because I don't want to mix that I'm here in service and ministry with I'm here because these are my friends and I want to be here. And, you know, even family gatherings, like even when it's just me and my immediate family, like the camera stays home because I don't want to mix that feeling of like, oh, I'm just here to get a good picture. And that's what everyone expects. And that's it. Like, I want to be there because you want me there, <laughs> you know, like that, that should be enough of contribution for this relationship. And I think it's really smart that you set that boundary. Um, so that it isn't just an ongoing expectation um, that isn't how you're seen. And then you don't have to worry about feeling used or taken advantage of. I mean, I have something similar with, you know, uh, albeit something like a high school reunion. This happened at my high school reunion. Uh, suddenly someone came over with their arm around a friend of ours and I hear her say, oh, well, Rachel's good to talk to about these things. She's a therapist here. She'll help you. And suddenly I'm, this person is deposited on me and it's, you know, an hour and a half reunion where I'm seeing people I haven't seen in decades and I would love to catch up. And now I have this person crying who was told that I would spend the time helping her. And so it happens, I think, in a lot of places and you just have to feel okay about saying I maybe another time, you know, or that's not really what I'm here for. It's not that I don't care, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's hard. Cash or credit? How are you paying for <laughs> this conversation? You know? Right. I know. Exactly. And I was thinking about that for anyone I know who's going to medical school. I'm like, you're going to be somewhere and they're going to say, I have this rash. Do you want to look at it? No, I don't. Actually. Who's your insurance provider? Let's talk about your <laughs> rash, you know. Um, <laughs> exactly. Well, but I, yeah, I think then figuring out your worth. I mean, here you know, being paid 500 a month, right? Even as a bachelor, I don't know how you get by and it's very difficult, but, um, but here you were trying to provide and they were not, they were not caring about that. Uh, even though they clearly had the funds because it sounds like you assessed that they were bringing in more at that time. So you could ask for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I discovered later to give context, the leader who sent me that text was paying himself a six figure salary on top of his expenses. So he was making six figures while also, and that's not including his rent reimbursement, his vehicle. I mean, he was making good money doing this work. And so that was something where, again, I found that out later. Like my feeling when he texted me was like, okay, well, he's probably doing the same thing. Like he's probably sacrificing too. And then retroactively, it's the retroactive scar thing. It's like, oh, I was really, like the wool was pulled far over my eyes during that conversation. And, you know, that radical sacrifice that was expected of you was not being carried out by the leadership, you know? That was a difficult thing to grapple with. Yeah, and that's usually the case. I mean, that's also another sign that something is not a healthy organization where sometimes the rules don't apply to the leaders in the same way, right? And also that they're living in a very different way with a, a lot more than the followers have. And so whenever there is this major discrepancy, you really have to wonder why it is okay with them to have people really suffering and be worried about how they're going to feed themselves or their loved ones. Well, you know, these people are having a private jet or whatever, you know, the level of riches are, right? That's very hard. Doesn't feel very spiritual, does it? 
And so then I wonder about after that, just, you know, leading into the work that you're doing now. So what was that trajectory after you left and dealing with kind of licking your wounds too, because you were needing to come off of, you know, a very difficult experience of needing to grapple with some real ethical and moral dilemmas as you saw them and and then figuring out how to be in the world and how, how to have the confidence or how to ask for the pay that you deserved, all the things that you needed to learn to do. And then how did you kind of get through that to the point where then you were able to start doing what you're doing now? So there was some overlap just in my figuring out where I stood faith-wise. And I, I would say I'm still figuring that out in a lot of ways. But you know, leaving the mission field, then leaving ultimately just ministry, which that was an explosive conversation too, that left us basically with, I mean, we were packing boxes around Christmas time, shipped back to another state, going to go live with family. My wife was pregnant again, and we had less than a thousand dollars, which then we had to end up paying in back rent to the brother of the leader of the organization. It was just a, it was a, horrible situation. We came back with no money. Now we've got a nine-month timer counting down because we have a baby on the way. And here we are sleeping on a couch at my parents' house. And I'm going, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I believe. I'm sad because we're dealing with a lot of trauma that's happened very quickly. And I was very much in a place where I was like, I just, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to even God's just slamming doors in our face, it felt like at the time. And my wife ended up showing me a listing. I had a lot of people that had promised like, hey, when you leave the organization, like we're going to pick you up in, as freelance and all this sort of stuff never happened. And it just kept, again, my trust in other people just kept dwindling. And, you know, I looked for a couple of jobs. I applied at like Starbucks. Like I was just trying to figure something out because I was like, I got to pay for diapers, you know? And my wife showed me a job listing for a, it was for social media marketing for a Toyota dealership in Hemet, California. And I was like, okay, like Hemet, great. I want to go work in Hemet. And um, California listeners know why that's such a horrible thought. It um, is. It is. And, and, uh, and there's also a Scientology compound there, which makes yes, it. There is. Yeah, yes, yes, there is. Yeah, yes, there is. And we we went to, which is such an eerie place. If you ever go golf oh. at the, uh huh. Right the golf there. Course, yeah. It literally mm-hmm. is such a weird experience because they've got electric fences and like thirty cameras all along the golf course. Because, I mean, that's where they hold people. It's such a bizarre thing. That's a whole nother episode. But I went to go apply there. I found out that it wasn't just a Toyota dealership. It was like the second largest auto group, or I think it was the second largest privately owned company. In Cal, I think in Riverside County, it was like next to Kaiser Permanente. It was like had the most employees. It was like almost 700 employees by the time I left that group. I got a job doing marketing. I was getting paid, I think, like, I think it was $12 an hour. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they're going to pay me $12 an hour to do this. Like, that's amazing. Um, and I have to say, that was one of the best environments I could have put myself in. It was so opposite of ministry. People cussed. It was like a very different vibe. Like, our goal was not eternal purpose. It was like, let's sell cars this month. And I just got to run around with a camera, be creative. I had amazing coworkers and they were all extremely nice. And the people who were the people that were like my unsaved coworkers were like way more of a light to me than any of the Christians I'd ever been around in the last couple of years. And it was just a really beautiful time. And it was a lot of fun. I got multiple raises. I was making really good money in the course of a year and a half. Like I got two raises and I got a raise like six months in. I got another raise at the end of the year. By the end of the second year, like I could ask for things and they would buy new equipment. And I like I had a good relationship with people. And the only reason I left there is because I started pursuing some entrepreneurial entrepreneurial paths and making more money outside of it than I was in, you know. But it was really a good reset. And it was a good reminder that like, hey, I'm not the only one that has the right answers. Like my friend who's not the same as me can be amazing too. And while I was there, I was still processing religious things. I was still looking at the IFB and reading stories that were happening because this was something that was happening all throughout the denomination, like repeats of these stories. And during my second year working at the car dealership, 
this story came across my phone that was literally the same exact story as what had happened when I was a teenager. And I was reading the story, I was like, same age of a victim, it's a pastor in the church. And the thing that pushed me over the edge was pastors were literally sending out tweets of support for the predator and raising money for his legal fees. And so I got off of work. I'm still in my work um, where I had changed in a t-shirt. I was driving home from work. I'm sitting outside my apartment and I just pulled out my phone and recorded a video to Facebook. And I said, if you are, and I listed all the pastors who had put out messages. So if you are connected to this pastor, if you support this ministry, if you do this, and or if your pastor supports them and you see their name in your prayer book, like you need to leave your church right now. And I just, it was this moment of clarity where it's like, I've had all these sidebar conversations with people, but like, we need to take this shit public. You know what I mean? Like, this is too far. And I basically said, hey, this person, this person, this person, some of whom I had worked with as clients before. Like, it was a very big move. And I decided right there in my car to say, I'm going to do that documentary I always talked about. I'm going to do something. We're going to get the word out. And, you know, I basically went in my house, cut together a little thing about the IFB. And within the next day, I had 20 people in my inbox going, I want to share my story. And so I was like, documentary is not going to cut it. I need to do a podcast where I can just have these stories every week. And I've been doing that for the last uh, three years. Again, that's the short version, but um, that's what kind of launched everything that is now. So when you were doing this video in your car, when you had pulled over and uh, were you worried about putting it out there and what would happen? No, I was at a position then. I didn't have any stake personally in the IFB in terms of like, when I sat there to record in my mind, I was just thinking, how much more could these people dislike me? Like at that point, it was like, I said what I need to say. My biggest concern really was, is this going to affect my relationship with my parents who still work at the church that whatever I like, I didn't, I was worried about like, is my dad get, is going to affect his job? Is there going to be like, I was worried about things like that. But as far as like, I wasn't worried like, hey, I'm not going to get allowed to speak in chapel at a, you know, that wasn't an option anyway. And I was too angry to care. Like it was, it was just like one of those things again, where it's like, really? Like you, when you see church letterhead asking for donations for a predator legal fees, like it's one of those like, okay, no holds barred. Like, let's go fight about this because this like really sucks. And so that's where I was like, I just have to do it. I did like a, it was like a nine minute video. And then the decision to finally say something, it's like, I'd been talking to my wife in the background for a couple of years. Like someone needs to do a documentary. Someone needs to do ongoing reporting on this. Someone needs to do it. And my wife to her credit, and she does this in my business stuff too. She's like, well, you can talk about it or you can do it, but I don't want to keep hearing you talk about it until you decide. And when I walked in the house, I said, I'm doing it. And then she was like, oh, great. <laughs> now you're doing it. So it was kind of one of those one of those situations. Right. It is quite exciting when something crystallizes and you feel very sure about it and it feels very right. And then also when you get the feedback, when you get 20 messages in your inbox, that's quite affirming. And you know that you have, you've hit a nerve. And that people want to be able to come forward. You know, one of the things that you get to do and you get to be when you do that, when you are one of the first people to come out and say something, is that then you let other people feel more comfortable who didn't want to be the first, but they were hoping probably that someone else would so that then they could jump on that. Um, so you really open the door for a lot of people who were waiting for someone else to give it a shot and be brave to be the first. I wonder with the responses that you got, were there responses that were not easy to receive? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and I want to give a shout out really quick to like Sarah Smith, who's a reporter for the Star-Telegram. She had done like a bombshell article, had found like 500 cases a year or so before that, um, you know, Daryl Dow was stuff on these like had been blogging about some of the absurdity of the IFB. So there were, I don't want ever want to just accept the title of the first to do it because there were some who had done it really well before. Um, but 
Also, there weren't many that were able to do it in an ongoing way. So Sarah Smith was a reporter. She can't just say, tell her editor, hey, every week I'm writing about the IFB. It's like, you've got other projects. So being able to do it in a weekly basis was important to me. Um, And then I think for me, all the feelings of fear and imposter syndrome happened after the show launched. And And it was because, it was for two reasons. One, I'm talking to people who, you know, and I've, I have a friend who's a trauma therapist who I says, don't compare trauma, you know, and she's right, but we do it, you know, and I was talking to people who I'm like, these are real survivors of real bad things. And am I worthy to share their story? And am I worthy to share a screen with them and talk about my experience and their experience? Like that starts going through your mind. And you know, and and I think that was healthy in a way because to this day, the people whose opinion matters to me is survivors. Like if a survivor tells me, hey, I feel like you're really invalidating a lot of people's stories, I'm going to listen and hear that feedback. The, the other reason that imposter syndrome set in was because the show, when I launched it, I told my wife in our kitchen, I said, if I can get like a hundred people to listen to the show by the end of the year, that would be great. By the end of the first year, there's tens of thousands of people listening. And so now I'm sitting there going, okay, if I'm thinking like this is an arena of people, I'm broadcasting this message to a lot of people who I don't know. Like I'm all of a sudden just out there. Like now I'm an influencer. And that was a scary place to be because it's just a lot of weight and responsibility beyond pulling someone aside at a party and telling them some information. So that set in and then the feedback from people started coming in, which for the most part was either 90% was survivors going, thank you, and people going, thank you for talking about this. Then a very loud 10% was pastors saying really obscenely crazy things. Pastors, literally, I have sermon footage of people who literally said like, you know, he's dragging people to hell with this podcast and, you know, all the kind of language I'm sure you can imagine. And so it was that was annoying, but it almost... Again, I was at a point, and I think it's good I started the show later than when I first left the movement. I was at a point where I understood that their belief about me had no weight on me, and they can believe I'm dragging people to hell, but if I know that's not true, if I had done the show when I still thought that was a very real possibility that I'm wrong and I'm going to hell because I disagree with the man of God, like it would have had a lot more weight. But instead, it kind of just reaffirmed like, I am touching that nerve. I need to keep going. Like they clearly are panicked about a 26 year old or 25 year old at the time with a podcast. They're in a pretty fragile boat. So let's keep rocking the the boat a little bit. So it just reaffirmed and, and just getting to meet so many cool survivors, like really just, it built this kind of community really quickly where I was like, we're headed in the right direction. I'm not doing everything right, but we're heading in the right direction. Right. And I wonder what else you were told when you were saying that they were saying crazy things. There are things that, you know, yes, that people are told that then you somehow are the evil one and you're the one who is doing bad things. Again, just because you're holding a mirror up to what happened and you're giving other people a forum to do that, which again, in a healthy organization, they would be happy that you're pinpointing where the problems are so that they can fix them if they don't want to fix them and they just don't want to be mm, kind of held to a certain standard, then yeah, it's never going to be appreciated. And what else were you told? Anything that that sort of weighed really heavily on you? Yeah, everybody that was connected to like the independent Baptist movement as a movement, the brand, were upset. And then I had a couple, like I had maybe four or five truly independent pastors who just had a church that didn't care about that world that were like reaching out positively. But it was very much a, we support you. We're not going to do it publicly because we don't agree with your stance on the King James Only Bible at the time and all that kind of stuff, which was like disappointing. But it's like, they were at least asking for resources to keep kids safe in their church. I'm like, that's good. Let's let's set the bar low. That's great. But as far as things that were said, I mean, again, it was just stuff like, it, it was just things like, oh, you're dragging people to hell. There were, there, there were times, I think, it didn't weigh on me at the moment, but there's times where when you're dealing with religious trauma and working through spiritual things, when you've been raised to say, basically, you're going to end up, if you start going down a slippery slope, you're going to end up not believing, you know, you're going to end up in hell because your your conscience is seared. Like all those sorts of things, like 
I got to a point where I would catch myself, not when I'm actively thinking, but when you're just kind of passively thinking and you have that intrusive thought of, what if they're right? What if I don't believe this now because my conscience is so far gone or God has turned me over to being a reprobate mind and all those kind of things. But for the most part, I think it was a pretty grounded thing. I mean, they said all kinds of stuff. I mean, you're dragging people to hell. One pastor said, it's good that some ex- abuse is being exposed by Eric and people like him, but it's kind of like they're maggots. Like they're eating away at bad flesh. You don't want maggots around, but let them do what they need to do. And then God will get rid of them. Like that kind of weird language. I will say the thing that really weighed on me, like as far as emotionally and what led to a lot more crying in the car, you know, early on was, you know, just the amount of stories I was allowing myself to hear in conjunction with each other. You know, when I started the show, I was doing three interviews a day and here I'm going to do this. And I didn't understand there was a secondhand trauma I was going to feel hearing the most horrific stories you've ever heard. And so I think early on, it was just like, again, not doing everything the right way. I wasn't learning how to space. I wasn't going for walks in between calls. I wasn't taking time to recenter myself. Like all of those things just led to me just going like, I would go sprint, 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 do as much as I can, post 40 times a day, do a bunch of interviews and then collapse. And then I'd be like, hey guys, I don't know if I'm going to keep the show going. I'm going to go for a month and take a break to then sprint, sprint, sprint to the same thing to now I feel like I have a very set cadence. I have things I don't do. I have things I don't watch. I have time after calls, I go and take a walk after that. Like I have things that I just do to reset. And I think early on, like that's what weighed on me most. It wasn't what pastors were saying about me. It was like, oh my God, I don't know how to process. I've talked to three rape victims in three hours who've told me very heavy things. And I feel fine on the interview. But then the minute that camera goes off, it all just hits me like a tidal wave. That's something I had to learn how to kind of stabilize and balance um, over time. Uh, I'm really glad you brought that up because first, you know, when you're raised in an organization similar to yours, there really isn't um, talk about self-care and, you know, being able to manage emotions and be there for people and and um, deal with really true things. And to keep going all day and all night, I think, is a value within a group that's more like a cult. And putting your feet up isn't necessarily and taking a break, going on vacation. When, you know, I think also having meaning and purpose it kind of flies in the face of people feeling like it's okay for them to do self-care when when they're in a cultic group or even when they first leave, that they need to devote themselves to something at kind of sacrifice themselves for it. And so I'm glad that you were able to catch yourself. I very much treated it like a ministry. You know, I went into it with that mentality of this is important. I need to help people. And all those things are true, but also I'm important. <laughs> I need to take care of myself and my family is important. And I'm not showing up as, and I I didn't very, you know, in the first year of doing the show, I wasn't showing up as the best husband I could be. Like my wife's dealing with, like, you feel like, hey, something's wrong. And I am like, I don't want to talk about it because I didn't, but then it's still affecting like, it's it's looming over like don't bother Eric because Eric just did a podcast and he can't handle it and it, it it's just learning to balance those things in a in a real way and not just doing you know I think in growing up in Christianity it's like everything's a war you're a soldier be a good soldier keep marching forward and it's like I realize now it's like it's very much a matter of like putting your oxygen mask on first. And being able to go like, how do I show up best in my interviews? It's not when I'm about to burst into tears myself when I sit down to record. Like it's when I'm sitting there going, like doing this right now, I can come into it and go, I'm prepared to talk about this. I know what I'm going to talk about. I feel comfortable expressing if there's one I don't want to talk about on this day and we can go into it. And that's such a healthier approach than if you would have interviewed me two years ago, I would have been like, yeah, last week I cried in the parking lot of Whole Foods randomly. That was cool. You know, like that's not a that's not a way to live. And it gets to a point where you fall into a very deep, depressed. I was extremely depressed. And then you have COVID and I lost a lot of income. Like there was all these factors that 
I was doing the unhealthiest thing ever that was doing really well. And that's a confusing thing, you know? Very, very confusing. You know, there is something also interesting about when you're listening to someone's story and it really is this crushingly depressing or disturbing story. I've needed to figure out how to manage that. And I try to get into a headspace where I think, I'm so happy that this person is finally getting to say this out loud and that it is this opportunity and it's hopefully really validating and releasing in some way for them. And so the the forum that I'm providing is I I think I think this through like okay this is what this is what this is going to be about because the the story itself is extremely heavy and really disturbing. And so it's nice for you to be able to get to that place sometimes where you're able to think the same thing of oh thank goodness this person finally gets to tell this and I've provided them with that space to do it. One of the things though that makes it really hard is when the sto- stories that you're hearing about are at the hands of people who are still getting away with it, who are still doing it, or the organization still exists, you know, that that becomes its own kind of maddening frustration. And I was wondering, just as I know we're kind of coming to a close soon, but about your your family, your parents, and what this whole process has been like, just as you've you've become this this voice for reason, I think, for this organization and other ones like it. And so where are your parents in this? I'll try to keep their private things private, but I think I think publicly, you know, my dad isn't in ministry at this point. Uh, still Christian, my mom, same. I think they've seen a lot. And I think that they've, um, you know, my mom, I think, is now, she's writing, she's trying to express through, she writes fiction books kind of based in that environment. I think that's how she's process, processing it. I think my dad is grappling, again, not to speak for him, I think he's grappling with the fact that he spent 20-some years believing this is the one thing I'm supposed to be doing. And I think now he's sitting there going, I thought that was going to be my purpose till I die. Like, it's this very difficult place to be. So I think they're in a good, I mean, I'm very close to them. Like, I see them about once a week. You know, I, we have a good relationship. And I think we are able to talk about things, which I think is better than, again, with many people I talk to, they haven't seen their parents in a decade or in five years, and they're never going to speak to them again. At least it looks like looking forward. And so, you know, it's just having conversations. And I think it's also, if I can add this for people who are navigating similar things, I think it's choosing your battles too. Like I could spend every week going, hey, you did this in November of 2010, you know, versus broadly talking about like, what's the most important things and branching out from there. And like, and understanding, like my dad worked a lot, you know, like I've talked about it before, but also that's not just a ministry focused thing. A lot of dads do that. And I think it's wrong and I can talk about how that affected me, but I also... I'm not going to waste the time I have with him now when he realizes that's not something he should be doing by just beating that dead horse. So I think it's acknowledging what hurt, talking about it, and then also having space to like, what's a relationship look like in 2023, 2024, and onward, you know, and what can we, again, acknowledge the bad and talk about the good and focus on the the day-to-day now. Really nice. So just as we're we're finishing up, I was wondering about hearing from you about what has helped you with your own healing. I'm sure doing this has been really helpful. And what else has proven to be helpful to you? I mean, it's really simple. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but like go, going on walks has become my, that's my thing that I do. I, I don't know. And for everybody, it's different. What's been really healing for me doing the show Uh, I'll try to give like three things. One, it's just been really scheduling out the show in terms of I do a very limited amount of interviews a week. I have it very regimented in my life. I don't listen or read. My time devoted to trauma, religious trauma, all that is anything for the show. So like if I'm not watching a series for research for the show or I'm not doing an interview and I'm reading someone's book to do the interview... I, my hobby is not religious trauma. Like people send me recommendations all the time. It's very nice. I'm not going to watch your true crime documentary unless it's for the show. Um, I just don't, that's my capacity for that. 
you know, the other thing that's been healing is I do another show about filmmaking and that's my passion and that's purely fun. And so I always say like Preacher Boys is my depressing show <laughs> in a lot of ways. And that's like my exertion show. And then film school is like, it's what fuels me up and it makes me really happy. And that's great. And then, like I said, walking, taking time to go outside and get fresh air and sunlight. I'm sorry, that's a super unoriginal answer, but like literally it revolutionized my day going off of a call and going and checking the mail a hundred feet away and just getting that fresh air and walking and then coming back to do whatever I need to do next. That moment to reset and go, it smells good outside. The wind is blowing. Sometimes it's way too hot because we're in Vegas, but for the most part, it's a chance to reset and focus on anything in the natural world beyond screens and sadness and all of those other things. So that's been kind of the big things that have helped. Really, really nice. Really nice. And so then how can people find your show and anything else you want them to be able to find that you're doing? Yeah. So uh, Preacher Boys is a podcast available literally anywhere you listen to podcasts um, or watch podcasts. So it's available on YouTube, it's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and every other random third-party podcast app that exists out there. So I would encourage people to check it out. Um, And again, it's not the right fit for everybody. If you can't handle or don't want to hear, which is totally valid, hear conversations that go into detail about grooming or sexual abuse, it's probably not a great show. There's a lot of shows that handle more of the funny things or quirky things. or But um, Preacher Boys really is focused on abuse within that movement. So it's a heavy show, but it's also a lot of people tend to find that helpful to really hear what they went through repeated on a podcast. The other thing I'd really encourage people to check out is I am part of a a four-part docu-series that is available on uh, Max, formerly known as HBO Max. Um, It's available to stream through uh, the Investigation Discovery um, channel on HBO Max. And so that series, as of this recording, I have not seen, um, but I know pretty much everybody in the series. I've had them on my show, and it, it is going to be a really, really cool um, basically lesson about what the IFB is and then how that whole system works. So if you're sitting here going, I don't know what the independent fundamental Baptist movement is. I still don't understand it. It's going to break down the origins of the movement. It's going to break down some of the biggest cases that have happened within that denomination. And I'm featured in it really as someone who's explaining as an armchair expert at this point, like how these groups are connected. And so um, definitely visit uh, Max to check out that documentary. It's called Let Us Pray. Um, it is a really exciting series, and I, I'm sure there'll be a link in the show notes to to go check out more information about that. Great. Right. That's so great. And it was so, so nice to talk to you. And I'm so glad you are where you are in your life. And that now you have a family and you're able also to really, I'm sure, be mindful about how you want to be able to raise your own kids in a very different way um, and to be able to think about themselves in in a different way than you were given an opportunity to when you were young. And so that can be very healing as well. It is a pleasure and I hope to be able to talk to you again. Yeah, it should be very soon. And I'm glad we finally met. Like I said, we've been in each other's orbit for long enough. I think it made sense to finally meet. But uh, thank you so much for having me on and thank you to everyone who's listened this far for listening to my story. It, It It's rare I get to talk about me, uh, so it's awesome to get to share a little bit. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to today's very special bonus episode of the Preacher Boys podcast, where I was in the hot seat with my friend Rachel Bernstein, who interviewed me on the Indoctrination podcast. I'm extremely happy with how the interview came out, and I hope you got a better glimpse of my own personal journey in and outside of the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And I really appreciate everybody taking the time to listen. A brand new episode is coming out on Sunday. Uh, So in just two short days, you're going to be hearing my conversation, my part two conversation with Ruthie Heiler, who is also featured in Let Us Pray. Let's keep the dialogue going and have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc.